And I don't know if we are still on the air, but I'll say this. You can't counter-program what All Elite Wrestling is doing. Perhaps you could counter-program me. Perhaps you could counter-program Nick or Brandy, but guess what? You cannot counter-program the love, the genuine feeling, the damn revolution that is All Elite Wrestling! Follow the buzzer. Rest in peace. Welcome to another episode of the JM Report. I'm your host, Guru JM, coming to you from CSP Studios in Tampa, Florida, the birthplace of pro wrestling. And this is episode 68 on this steaming hot summer day. We've been getting hit with storms left and right, on and off. Some lasting at the very least about 10 minutes. I realized something, matter of fact, just yesterday, late afternoon, maybe a couple hours before the sunset, it was pouring rain over my house. And then when it was starting to clear up a little bit, uh, the sun peaked through the clouds. It was still uh, not drizzle, whichever level up is from drizzle, but it's not hard raining. It was so funny, especially out here. You see it all the time um, uh, this time of year. Uh <laughs> It could literally be raining where you're standing and right across the street, it's not. So I peeked out to see, uh, you know, to see if there's any flooding or whatnot in front of my house. And uh, I step out and it's still raining right in front of my house. I step towards the front door and it's not raining. (laughs) It's almost as if... uh, that was the cutoff line. That was the point of no return for the rain. You, you, you rain there enough, time to move on. Just let's soak up a little bit the front yard now. So it's, yeah, I'm still not used to it for as long as I've been out here. And I, I still find it hilarious whenever I see that. On a more serious and personal note, um, wasn't sure if I wanted to say anything, but well, only because I don't think he's aware of it, uh, nor his family, his uh, immediate family. But uh, just yesterday, I received some horrible, sad news that uh, my godfather had passed away. And um, though I'm not sure exactly what led to his passing, but... Um, uh, days before, maybe a few weeks ago, I got a message from my god sister, if you will, that uh, he slipped and fell and hit his head. My understanding that there were several blood clots and um, they performed surgery to relieve the pressure and the stress on three 
of the bigger ones and to leave the smallest one again this is it's all give, uh, given to me in pieces the story and that the smaller one will be monitored and that maybe it didn't need the surgical attention that the others received and with uh, medicine and time it would um, it would go away the surgery took place and um, although responsive but um, didn't um, didn't say much and my godfather never opened his eyes again <clears throat> he was a great man treating me very well my only regret is that I never got to see him again I had to be at least five maybe six years ago went out to his home he was long retired moved way out in uh, Pennsylvania it's nothing but land bought property built a brand new home and had another house built right next door for his uh, eldest daughter and her family and I was fortunate enough to witness firsthand the beautiful land that they've chosen and the beautiful home that they've created for life after hard work and labor for so many decades and that they could uh, enjoy each other's company. And always good times, always laughs, always stories to share, stories to tell. And I could not have been any more grateful to have known such a person to have known such a great family i would like to dedicate this episode to him and to let him know how much i'm going to miss him and that one day i'll see him again and may you rest in peace. This past weekend was just packed with so many wrestling events, wrestling pay-per-views, what have you. I tried. <laughs> I tried, at least with the uh, resources that are available to me, to either... To either uh, What's the term? Uh, simulcast. Uh, maybe one on my television, maybe another on my computer, another on my phone. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I wasn't aware. For, for as much as I was trying to um, cover uh, AEW's Fight for the Fallen, uh, for reasons beyond me, I, I didn't realize that it was available on Bleacher Report, I was told after the fact. Um, I was able to watch the show maybe the next day, but the day of, um, it just didn't cross my mind to look it up. And uh, e even then I had my, my mind on uh, other things, more personal things. But uh, I was able to catch up, cover as much as possible. Uh, I'll say this here, I wasn't able to watch the G1. That was, that's uh, been taking place, I believe, just yesterday was night five, so it's still ongoing. And <laughs> it is a lot to take. Um, hopefully, 
I'll be able to have said resources and um, able to bring the results. I mean, yeah, it's one thing to read off the results for you and uh, not give my opinion because I didn't see it. So I feel like I'll I'll be uh, denying that to anyone. I just can't say, oh, Jack Sabre Jr. defeated Okada for the Never Open Weight Championship. Okay, how did it happen? <laughs> you know, how? I, I, I like to give some detail at the very least as to who, what, where, how, and why. So, with that said, there was the AEW Fight for the Fallen. And at first, I missed the first match of the, uh, of the pre-show. Just lost track of time again. There was just so much going off at the time. And the event itself was done for a great cause. Great charity event, if you will. And took place in Jacksonville, Florida, out in the uh, Daly's Place. Perhaps one of the most unique settings you'll ever see for a wrestling event. It's more of a uh, concert hall venue. And where the musicians would play, they had seatings for fans, which really... They didn't, get get, uh, didn't, didn't get to see much of because that's that's the hard camera side. And the bigger portion where the, the fans were sitting was uh, was the background for that hard camera. And when they had the wide shots, again, it had a very unique look to it. Uh, the ramp was leveled with the ring floor. And had only had one entrance, unlike previously for Double or Nothing, where it had one for the heels, one for the faces. Everyone, everyone came and left through the same uh, opening stage. But I believe it added more to the atmosphere because, again, it's so different. And it just, again, just gave that um, view of uniqueness. The proceeds of the event went to the Victim Assistance Advisory Council, or the VAAC for short as per their website uh, duties and responsibilities to coordinate and encourage cooperative efforts among social services criminal justice mental health and other agencies and persons public and private whose purpose is to provide assistance to crime victims their families and their significant others this also includes those affected by gun violence, which was the uh, the theme for Fight for the Fallen. At the end of the, uh, at the end of the event, they were able to raise one hundred fifty thousand dollars. Cody Rhodes, as you heard earlier, uh, well, wasn't exactly <laughs> wasn't exactly uh, uh, referring to. Um, the proceeds, but right before we got to that little kind of programming comments, he made sure all the proceeds, speaking to the mayor, speaking to the governor, Jacksonville, make sure that everything goes to the families of those affected, those in need. Every single dollar. This was months in planning, months in advance. We all knew this was happening. I didn't read anywhere that there will be a follow-up, uh, Fight for the Fallen 2, for example. Maybe not so soon, but if this, if this is going to be an annual event, I'm all for it. Perhaps in different uh, towns, different cities, different states. But uh, one thing at a time, again, AEW is still growing and still getting their feet wet. During the pre-show, the librarian Peter Avalon versus Sonny Kiss. 
Sonny Kiss would win with a split-legged leg drop off the second rope for the pin. It's uh, very impressive. Um, I was able to actually meet, uh, may I call him Mr. Kiss, <laughs> uh, numerous times in New York, actually. And it was it was maybe bef- just before Double or Nothing, give or take, that um, he was able to sign with AEW. And if I run into him again in New York, uh, maybe in November, hopefully I can give a chance to say congratulations. It was a great opportunity for him. And uh, yeah, great showing here. Hell, even his entrance. Great dance number. Came out with some of the uh, cheerleaders of the Jacksonville Jaguars. Even their mascot. So, <laughs> great great outing and even a more great performance in the ring. We had the women's tag team match. Dr. Britt Baker DMD teaming up with Riho. Versus Shoko Nakajima and Bay Priestley. And yes, I tried much better this time to pronounce their names properly. Unfortunately, the match uh, wasn't as good. I say that because you could tell of the lack of chemistry. And even more so early in the match where Priestley kicked in the back of the head, Dr. Baker, and immediately something was, something was wrong. Baker suffered a concussion, although she continued the match, but perhaps the injury was far more serious than uh, upon witnessing what we saw on television was worse. At one point, she tried to tag in her partner, but went to the wrong corner. And just looked like she was loopy. Her usual... um, Style was off by a half a step or so. And always, you could could see that she was always, uh, like, not not massaging, but checking on her head, her neck, how how much pain she might have been in. The referee did check on her numerous times, but I'm I'm only going to assume that she kept telling the referee that she was fine, she wanted to continue. And I respect that, but, you know, the light's on, nobody's home kind of thing. You know, your, your body's on automatic pilot. And... Who knows how much more she could have hurt herself and maybe another participant in the match in another botched spot. Thankfully, that did not happen. But I'm pretty sure uh, AEW personnel will look into this and say, hey, to the referees especially, doesn't matter how how good they say they are, they shouldn't be uh, playing doctors, well, technically Britt Baker is a doctor, but you know, a medical, a more medical doctor than a dentist. Uh, and, and I mean that with great respect. But to not to self uh, analyze himself or self diagnose themselves, to think everything's fine, there's no pain, but damage is done. And that uh, maybe have a plan B on standby. There could have been someone else in the back that wasn't uh, scheduled or prepared to wrestle to take Baker's spot and continue the match. But even if that happened, again, the, it's just the chemistry was way off. But thankfully, in the end, Nakajima hits a, her, a hurricanrana to pin the shoulders of uh, Riho for the win. And the match was over. Baker was taken to the back and more than likely take some time off to recover. Not sure how much this would affect her, her regular job as a DMD. But the official event began with a six-man tag team match as MJF teamed up with Sean Spears and Sammy Guevara versus Joey Janela, Jimmy Havoc, and Darby Allin. Despite having friction between MJF and Spears, Spears was still able to hit his Death Valley driver onto Allin to win the match. Of course, uh, if you remember, it was Spears who attacked Cody Rose at the end of uh, double or nothing and MJF is uh, pretty close with Cody Rhodes in, in AEW and I just smacked my microphone Ali versus Brandy Rhodes who had awesome con in her corner Brandy would win the match hitting her bionic spear 
I thought it was an interesting and cool name, to get the pin and win. But after the match, both Brandy and Awesome Kong attempted a double team onto Ali, only for Aja Kong to make an appearance and go face to face with Awesome Kong. So here is probably one of your matches set up for All Out Kong versus Kong. Despite having a height advantage, that being Awesome Kong, I think, no pun intended, would be an awesome match. These two have history dating back to Japan. Uh, did they have history in uh, Impact? I, I stopped watching Impact for years, so I, I, can't, I, I can't honestly tell you yes and no. But I've always wondered, huh, I wonder if Aja Kong knows about Awesome Kong, and here we are. Good call, by the way, to have this match uh, set up for All Out, more than likely. So this next match had a more tongue-twisting stipulation as opposed to the tongue-twisting huge name that was given to the Battle Royal this past Monday night. So I'm going to try, and hopefully everyone keeps up with me. But in a three-way tag team match, the Dark Order versus Jack Evans and Angelico versus Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus, and the winners of this match will take on the best friends at All Out, and the winner of that match will receive a bye in the first round of the AEW Tag Team Championship Tournament. Simple, right? So it would be no surprise that it was the Dark Order who attacked the best friends back in Double or Nothing, and that they will face each other at All Out, and curious to see who will move on and receive a bye. Of course, uh, the Dark Order had uh, maybe a little more henchmen dressed in black, masks than normal, but there will be a reason for it. Stay tuned. Hangman Page versus Kip Saban. We will see Page hitting the Deadeye for the win. And after the match, one of the masked men who came up with the Dark Order returned ringside and attacked Paige. And we will come to find out that it was Chris Jericho in disguise, leaving Hangman Page laid out. So Cal Uncensored and Lucha Bros. Scorpio Sky ate the pin here after a stomp and power driver combination by the Lucha Brothers. We all know the Lucha Brothers will be part of the tag team tournament. Curious to see how far they'll make it. Kenny Omega took on Shima, yes, and I know I mispronounced that name big time last week. But it will be Omega after this hard-hitting match to get the win after hitting one winged angel. Chris Jericho will return to the ring, not dressed in the black mask, to cut a promo on Hangman Page, calling him a, well, a bitch. And this brings out Hangman Page, and a huge brawl ensues, referees and agents, and other wrestlers try to break it up, and they will see each other once again at All Out. In the main event, in a special exhibition match, if you will, the Rhodes brothers, Cody and Dustin, took on the Young Bucks. And surprisingly, the Bucks win after hitting a, after hitting a Meltzer driver onto Cody Rhodes to win the match. So, overall, I think the Fight for the Fallen show as a wrestling show, I thought it was a great event. Uh, it adds more to it, knowing that they got together for a great cause. And just wasting no time, AEW is uh, making their presence known that, hey, we're not just here to have wrestling shows one town and another. They give back. That's not to say that others don't, but, you know, they still have a lot to learn, AEW does, as far as some production values. Uh, I mentioned earlier about during the women's tag team match, during the pre-show, maybe there'll be better uh, protocols in play. You can't just rely on the wrestler that's hurt, again, on the spot to say, I'm fine, but minutes later, you, you, you botch uh, one or two moves. It's clearly evident that you're not loopy and you don't know where you are. And you've gotten, you could have gotten more seriously hurt and the process hurt someone else. So, yeah, 
details like that. Production wise, I mean, there, there were some improvements ever since uh, Double or Nothing. I'm not gonna say that it's the the layout of the venue itself. They knew that ahead of time, so it wasn't like they didn't have any time to prepare and anticipate any potential issues or problems. But uh, I think uh, sound quality was much better. Not not too many echo feedback background noise when in, when whenever anyone cut a microphone or or even uh, doing a match. So yeah, kudos for yet another successful AEW event. I, I really, I, I know I've been doing a lot of that here lately, but for my, I guess, full-blown comparison with WWE, I, I will wait on that until they debut. Not head-to-head, but when they debut on TNT for their weekly show, and then naturally i'm sure everyone's going to do this naturally there will be a comparison in every possible way in every meaning of the word between raw between smackdown between AEW and who and whomever else is thinking of having a weekly show that time of year of course Cody Rhodes um after the match you can get on the microphone as you heard a little bit of it earlier and Well, I try to be on neutral ground as much as possible when it comes to these things. But again, we all knew knew this event was happening months in advance. WWE counter-programmed maybe a week or so, if that, in advance. They they announced it the weekend before and then during their weekly shows. I think, matter of fact, I think only on Raw that they mentioned that Evolve's 10th anniversary show would take place. Saturday night, the same night as Fight for the Fallen. Nearly head-to-head, although I think there might have been a half an hour difference. Uh, For Cody to be upset, I don't blame him. Unfortunately, uh, he should know that's business. And this is absolutely nothing, nothing new that Vince McMahon or whomever it was in WWE to make that call, Triple H, to... uh, have an alternative uh, solution or programming in this case for one for one wrestling show to watch another. I'm sure, we all heard stories from the '80s when it came to Starcade and Survivor Series in 1987. Cable companies aren't like how they are now. You have more than one pay-per-view channel. You would have to have. This was so crazy back then. You have to go to the cable company, pick up a, well, you order the pay-per-view and you pick up a specific separate box and then you hook up to the back of your cable box at home and that's what gave you the signal to uh, to, to view the pay-per-view live. I, I don't remember if it also offered the replay later on that day or what happened. <laughs> and... The, uh, most of the country, and even though cable wasn't available to everyone yet, but most of the country back then in 87, the majority got to see Survivor Series over Starcade. And Starcade probably was seen mostly in the smaller homes and cities. Story goes, McMahon muscled his way through the cable companies like, hey, listen, you got WrestleMania 3, the biggest pay-per-view of the year, probably the biggest one at the time. You're going to carry Survivor Series. The hell with the other one. And I'm pretty sure a nice little heavy briefcase full of Benjamins was involved. Nowadays, it's a little easier. (laughs) And the only difference is we've all could have simulcast. Like I I was trying to do one on the computer, one on my TV, another one on my phone, whichever combination would have worked, tablet. So, many are going to ask. Many have been asking how fair that was. You have a charity event versus a 10th anniversary show. That they themselves could have streamed somewhere else. Not necessarily on the network because you're paying for the network. Fight for the Fallen was for free. 
raised $150,000 for a good cause. The, the Evolve show, which was a pretty good show. I don't know what the numbers were, but I thought it was pretty entertaining. Despite having a uh, surprise appearance by Paul Heyman. Well, well, what do you expect? Philadelphia. Extreme rules was the next night. And all I would say to Cody, uh, if he is listening, <laughs> Expect more of this to happen. And unfortunately, there, there isn't anything that could be done because at the end of the day, people will make their own decisions. And of course, one positive way to look at this is fans could have watched your show first and then go back to watch Evolve, vice, maybe vice versa. But... I don't think no pure pro wrestling fan today did not miss any of these uh, pay-per-view events that took place this past weekend. With that said, let's just run real quick through the results of the Evolve 10th anniversary show that aired on the WWE Network. For those who don't know, Evolve is one of the stomping grounds, no pun intended, and I did mention this last time, for potential talent to acquire to sign with either NXT or straight to the main roster. So if, these, if, if a lot of these names don't sound familiar to you, it's okay. I might have uh, heard, I will say about half of them, with all due respect. But that didn't stop me from enjoying the show, as I did this past Saturday night. So the opening match, we saw Josh Briggs versus Anthony Green. Briggs was able to hit a choke slam into a power bomb. Imagine that visual for the win. In a fatal four-way match, we saw Sean Maluda versus Kurt Stallone versus Steppenwolf versus Harlem Bravado. In a pretty uh, pretty good match, I gotta say, I, I really enjoyed this. Stallone and Wolf all used their high flying skills to excite the crowd. While Bravado played the heel, of course. But it would be Steppenwolf, the winner of the Fatal 4-Way after hitting a shooting star press. Arturo Ruha versus Anthony Henry. After a barrage of punches and one spinning back kick, it was Ruha's with the win over Henry. Brandy Lauren took on Blackheart. Before the match even started, Natalia Markova attacked Blackheart from behind, and this made the match into a no DQ and a two on one handicap match. Okay, just making rules up as we go. It's great to see Evolve is piggybacking off WWE's mind mindset here. Just, ah, just make it up as you go. Who cares? Towards the end, there was a crazy spot as Anthony Green returned to assist Lauren, who was in his corner earlier on in the night, to avoid a suicide dive from Blackheart, and instead ended up landing on the pile of chairs that Lauren had set up. Back in the ring, an onslaught of kendo sticks, Lauren pins Blackheart for the win. Again, not bad of a match. Uh, I, I thought that spot with the suicide dive onto a pile of chairs was really sick. But uh, hey, sometimes you got to be creative and different to be standing out from everyone else. From NXT, Papatuni took on Kobe Carino. Papatuni, I'm sure many of you are familiar from the greatest Royal Rumble a couple of years ago. Despite having interference from Sean Maluda, Babatuni still picked up the victory. For the Evolve Tag Team Championships, AR Fox and Leon Ruff versus the Unwanted. And it was Ruff who finished off Kingston with a 450 splash from the top rope to win and become the new Evolve Tag Team Champions. In one of the best matches of the night, from NXT, Drew Gulak took on Matt Riddle. Of course, both men are alumni of uh, Evolve Wrestling. In another great match, 
Riddle was able to counter the Gulak into a Bro Derek for the pin and win. In a winner takes all title for title, champion versus champion match, WWN champion versus Evolve champion, Austin Theory versus JD Drake. Theory was able to, to kick out of a drill bit from Drake and was able to make a comeback with three super kicks followed by a taxia for the win and claim and unify the evolve and wwe championships of course post-match theory uh basically uh renounced the wwe the w wow the wwe title and just threw it to the ground steps on it and just wants to be recognized as the evolve champion Lights go out, they come back, and it's Briggs back in the ring delivering a choke slam onto Austin Theory. So this will probably set up a match later on. And in your main event at a Evolve 10th anniversary show for the NXT Championship, Adam Cole defending against Ikira Tozawa. Towards the end, Cole will grab the NXT title it was about to hit Tozawa with it, only for Johnny Gargano to make the save. Tozawa took advantage, hitting it with a German suplex. And it looked like he was about to build up momentum to win, but Cole was fast enough to hit the last shot and retain the championship. And this leads to Extreme Rules. The very next day on Sunday, the pre-show, or the kickoff show as they call it, had uh, at least one match that was thrown together in a matter of hours the day of, which I'll get into in a second. But it was only a matter of time for the Cruiserweight title to be regulated back to the kickoff show as Drew Gulak, fresh off his appearance at Evolve, defended against Tony Nese, the former champion. And I like uh, the story that they told here that although Gulak pinned uh, uh, Tazawa back at stomping grounds for the title and win the championship. Uh, he intentionally, Gulak did, left the nameplates on the title that still said Nice or Tony Nice to prove that he could still beat him for the championship, which took place here. Gulak retained the Cruiserweight title over Tony Nice, and only then backstage during one of those exclusive video clips on social media that Drew Gulak finally changed out the nameplates for his own. We first saw this match between Shinsuke Nakamura and Finn Balor on last week's episode of SmackDown, which led into this title match on a pre-show for the Intercontinental Championship. Shinsuke Nakamura is your new Intercontinental Champion, seemingly out of nowhere, but I'll get into that a little bit later. But well-deserved, I won't argue that, but my God, it just take forever. If the intent was never to make Shinsuke Nakamura in a WWE at least a world or universal heavyweight champion, yes, he was the United States champion, but let's face it, it wasn't the best run for that title. And now that he has the Intercontinental Champion that at least does carry some or a lot of prestige, I should say, versus the created version of the WWE's United States title. I think for now is in good hands, Shinsuke still being a heel. So it makes you wonder who would be his next opponent, although we kind of had a glimpse into the future as far as that goes. But Shinsuke Nakamura defeated Finn Balor during the pre-show of Extreme Rules to become the new Intercontinental Champion. The show itself kicked off surprisingly with Roman Reigns and The Undertaker taking on Drew McIntyre and Shane McMahon. At the end, it was Shane himself to eat not only the pinfall, but a tombstone for his trouble. During the post-match celebration, if you could read lips, Undertaker passing the torch, which must have at some point between then and SmackDown, uh, either was rained on or dropped and the light just vanished because 
Undertaker told face to face uh, Roman Reigns, "It's your yard now." Pat him on the chest, and this had to have, this had to have been a genuine reaction from Roman Reigns. He rarely smiles, if ever, after a match, regardless of how brutal it was or how much of a payback it was. Think about it. How often does he smile? And take a grants him the yard and Roman Reigns with a huge smile on his face. Holy shit. He just said what he what he said and wow. I, I don't know how much more of an impact there would have been had Taker said that on a microphone, but you know, Roman Reigns is here to stay, folks. Taker is gonna only be around so much longer. And I say that because you can't stop the clock. Taker has had numerous injuries, has had numerous surgeries. He does have a family to support, not that no one else does. But he's not the same Undertaker from the 90s or the Attitude Era or or the Ruthless Aggression or uh, Biker Taker, uh, Dead Man Walking and uh, Dead Man Inc. and all that. But when the day finally comes... And we all thought it was the past couple of years. But I'm still under the impression that I'll believe it when I see it. I'd rather hear it from an old man's lips. For the Raw Tag Team Championships, the Revival, Dashing and Wilder, took on the Usos. In the end, well, really no surprise here. There's only so much more that they, they can do with this uh, angle, this Revival. Not that Revival, but Rival, I should say. <laughs> As uh, they retained Scott and Dawson over the Usos at Extreme Rules. In the match of the night, one of the most physical ones in a long time, I believe. Cesaro versus Alistair Black. My goodness, did these guys left everything in the ring. In the end, it took a Tremendous looking spinning back kick black mass from Alistair taking out Cesaro and get the pin. These two would have a rematch on SmackDown, but I'll get to that later on. For the women's SmackDown championship, Bailey defended against two opponents and challengers in Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross. Bailey was able to overcome all the odds. And delivered a flying elbow off the top rope to Nikki Cross to pin and win and retain the Women's Championship. And I don't know what they're doing here creatively. At the very least, have a little bit of conflict between Cross and Bliss the next night on Raw. But no, nothing. They carried on the rest of the week as if nothing happened. Yes, Nikki Cross apologized, but nothing more than that. At the, at the very least, have Alexa a little bit upset that things didn't go her way despite having the advantage two-on-one and that Nikki, in, in, in Alexa's mind, or, or from her point of view, dropped the ball. Last man standing, Braun Strowman versus Bobby Lashley. This match was a lot better than I thought it was going to be. These guys fought all over the place. And yes, they even made it to the concession stand where... At first, I thought it was a conveniently placed uh, construction wall. Or maybe, I mean, maybe the place was legit under construction. Or maybe uh, those who run the arena didn't want any damage done. So, like, okay, we'll just wall off that part of the uh, arena and compensate for any financial loss that that whatever was behind the wall, whatever uh, retail store or snack shop or whatever it's called, would have made for the day. But uh, no, nothing happened here other than the fact that Braun Strowman counted a suplex into the wall that did not break on Bobby Lashley. And my God, you would think somebody threw a grenade or something and the cameraman just went because Bobby Lashley, just before he made contact with the wall, he's upside down, by the way, cameraman goes absolutely apeshit like someone dropped a crab in his pants. And you didn't even get to see it. There wasn't hell. There wasn't even a replay of it. That pissed me off. Like, why would you do something like that? 
they need to stop with this seizure inducing camera shaking nonsense it does not add anything it doesn't wouldn't be surprised if you know what if anyone out there suffers from seizures and watch something like the camera work from WWE especially on Raw and Smackdown and especially on their pay-per-views please let me know because my eyes hurt legit my eyes freaking hurt every time I see something like that and it's throughout the show no matter from what distance I sit in front of a television they hurt my eyes just let us see what's happening man these two eventually fought back into the arena to the uh, hard camera side of, of the fans and uh, a well placed uh, blocked off entrance or at least one of them with plywood and crash pads that we did not see but you, if you listen real hard you could have heard on impact but these two fought right on top of this particular entrance Strowman would place Lashley into the power slam position and jump off the railing there into the boxed off plywood area referee didn't even bother to check I mean if this was kayfabe referee did not even bother to see if everyone was all right he peeked around from the top came down the steps unless he has x-ray vision and assumed everybody was okay he began to count and at about the seven and eight count Strowman a la Shockmaster breaks through the wall but did not fall over was declared the winner when the referee reached the count of 10 counting down Lashley and Strowman is your new well the the winner of the last man standing triple threat tag team match for the Smackdown tag team championships the new day of Big E and Xavier Woods take on heavy machinery and champions Daniel Bryan and Rowan and to honestly to my surprise unless there's something else going on the New Day would hit their up up down down finishing maneuver onto Bryan to win back the Smackdown Tag Team Championships so this really threw me off guard I'm, I know it threw off a lot of people that as they didn't expect it speaking of which Ricochet defended his United States Championship against AJ Styles before the match even started. The other club members beat down Ricochet and still stayed at ringside. Right? What are the referees on nowadays? But at the end, Ricochet was about to deliver. Well, he climbed to the top row, was going to deliver something, maybe a missile drop kick or high cross body. Uh, Anderson on the opposite side of the ring distracted the referee. This allowed Gallows to climb up on the apron, make Ricochet lose his balance. And AJ Styles set up a super Styles clash off the second rope. It looked brutal. And, and it wasn't that Styles landed uh, jumping forward. He had to jump back and then take a face bump with Ricochet underneath him. And thankfully, Ricochet knew what to do to look up, not tuck his chin, as many wrestlers are trained to do. But it, it didn't take away the fact that this was a great match. I thought one of the best right behind the Alice Bach and uh, Cesaro match. Good outing here. And AJ Styles is your new United States champion. In a match that was well, uh, really unnecessary despite the, the promo that took place after. But Dolph Ziggler and Kevin Owens went one-on-one. -on -one. Ziggler runs into the ring. The bell rings. Stunner, pin, and the bell rings. In a matter of about 13 seconds by my count, Kevin Owens squashed Dolph Ziggler here. But he would get on a microphone and mock the fact that Shane McMahon was taken out by a tombstone earlier in the night by The Undertaker. And yeah, he's not too fond of him. For the WWE Championship, Samoa Joe challenged Kofi Kingston in a match where Samoa Joe was mostly dominant. And at the end, it just took one trouble in paradise to pin Samoa Joe to retain the WWE title. And also for his trouble, gave Samoa Joe a black eye. But he's a tough, tough cookie. And the main event where winners, plural, winners take all for the Universal and the Raw Women's Championship. Extreme Rules 
I guess. Uh, Lacey Evans teamed up with Baron Corbin to take on champion Seth Rollins and champion Becky Lynch. There wasn't really anything holding back against, at least the rules anyway, from having intergender interaction. Uh, there was some, of course, Lacey Evans would mock and tease uh, Rollins. And by the way, she had stitched in her, the back of her tights, her shorts, the name Seth, S-E on one side, T-H on the other. And <laughs> in all fairness, I, I think the cameraman, while she was making her entrance on the apron, the cameraman there, right underneath her on the, on the ring floor, on the arena floor, was trying to get a shot of it. But instead, Lacey just bent over and we got a preview of what would have been her colonoscopy. And uh, yeah, thanks for that, Lacey. There was no cutaway. Cameraman did not move back or zoom out. He just, ah. <laughs> the match continues. There was a great table spot here by both Becky and Seth. Two tables laid out on the floor. Becky delivers a leg drop onto Lacey Evans while Rollins would jump over that, delivering his frog splash onto Baron Corbin on another table. It was an amazing uh, visual there. Back in the ring, Lacey was taken out. Becky Lynch was, te was checking in on Seth Rollins. In comes Corbin, who delivers the end of days. My goodness that she bumped her ass off here, Becky Lynch. Corbin, he gained a little bit of respect for me as a heel after this. He gets up. He turns to Seth Rollins. What are you going to do about it? <laughs> he, said, he said a little bit more than that, but trying to keep it PG today. Um, trying. And, of course, we get a close-up of Rollins' face. He's steaming pissed off. I mean, what boyfriend, husband wouldn't seeing something like that happen to his girlfriend or wife? He gets up and beats a living snot out of Corbin with a kendo stick and then change it out to a chair. Curb stomp. A second curb stomp. A third curb stomp. And finally pins Baron Corbin, hopefully ending. Because Becky Lynch put this as one of the stipulations that this was the last time that either one will go after these titles. Well, considering what happens shortly after, yeah, kind of a no-brainer no there. But Lacey Evans could still make a claim because she was never pinned. So as the celebration ensues, Becky Lynch is still on the outside, knocked out. Rollins is trying to gather himself. And then... The infamous music hits. As earlier on in the day, Paul Heyman would address the crowd about a spoiler. Now, is he telling the truth or was he being Paul Heyman? Which kind of means the same thing nowadays. But Brock Lesnar did make his appearance. Comes down to the ring. German suplex. Beats down Rollins. Tells Heyman to hand over the briefcase to the referee to cash in. The bell rings. One F5 later, the bell rings again, and Brock Lesnar regains and becoming the first ever three-time Universal Champion in the WWE. <sighs> you know, there was a lot of debate after the fact, after this. How, why, why again? And people were saying, whoa, Rollins wasn't drawing as a champion. Okay. That could be one argument. But hopefully the people who make that argument are not the same people that made the argument about the universal title never being on television, never being defended, never appearing on pay-per-views and yada, yada, yada. So I'm going to ask you, if Seth Rollins not drawing as a universal champion, but still having the universal title on television, any better than not having the universal title on television at all. I mean, I got to ask again, was this championship specifically and only created to keep a Lesnar under contract for the WWE and keep him happy because as champion, you get a bigger payday whenever you show up, despite what your contract says. And I saw a few comments on Facebook, uh, 
later on that night and the next day, hey man, if you had if you had Lesnar's contract and get paid to do absolutely nothing to stay at home, being champion or not, wouldn't you take it? Honestly, no. It beats the purpose of him being called a, a hard worker, the the this and that, or pro wrestling. He's an attraction. Okay, besides working out and keeping in shape at home, okay, you want to show off your skills on occasion, on television, on pay per view. Quote, defend that title. But we'll see. I, I think I think it was more of a shock value, more of well, let's kill off that momentum for now and move forward. Maybe it won't go back on Rollins right away. Uh, it could be someone else in mind that we're not seeing right now because we have officially entered the Heyman and Bischoff era because Bischoff just finally finished moving into Connecticut. So it makes sense for them to wait to finish off and and uh, see the end of these current storylines up until Extreme Rules and start fresh the next day on Raw and the next day on SmackDown, which we'll get into. Raw opened up with Paul Heyman and Brock Lesnar and had to see, had to determine who will be the next opponent for Brock Lesnar for SummerSlam. So they wasted no time booking Lesnar for the immediate next pay-per-view in about a month from now. So Heyman announces, and this will be probably the only time I'm going to say it on the show because it's too damn long, a 10-man all-star cross-branded battle royal where the winner takes on Brock Lesnar for the Universal title at SummerSlam. <sighs> yeah, Darth Raider. That's tongue-twisting of a name that is that is. Imagine that on a t-shirt. And that would be your main event for Raw later on. And in the only two out of three falls match of the week, the Usos and Ricochet took on Robert Roode and The Revival. In case you haven't noticed, Roode has grew out his beard again. So shouldn't he be Bobby? So we literally get two quick pinfalls for the first and second fall. As Ricochet claims the first, Scott Dawson claims the second, and we go to commercial. We come back and we begin the third fall, and Ricochet delivers his recoil and 630 combo onto Bobby Roode or Robert Roode to win the match. The club head to the ring and this upsets Ricochet and a brawl ensues involving everyone in the match. The Usos, the Revival, the babyfaces get beaten down, including Ricochet in the ring as the club stands over him after being laid out. The Viking Raiders defeat another local tag team in a squash and a very quick match. We got a better idea what is to become of Cedric Alexander moving forward after being a surprise participant, being involved in the main angle between Roman Reigns and Shane McMahon and Drew McIntyre. So here, Cedric went one-on-one -on -one with Drew McIntyre, perhaps, uh, again, testing the waters to maybe put Cedric in a, in a more upper mid-card position after going one-on-one -on -one with Drew McIntyre. And despite being mostly dominated, Cedric with the surprise and upset victory over McIntyre who pinned his shoulders. And he, this was probably the first time McIntyre was pinned on the main roster since coming up from NXT. Best to my memory. And it, it was crazy. It was very surprising. The crowd in, in Long Island really got behind this. And uh, yeah, good for Cedric. To see how, how, how much further he gets with this. We get a promo between Samoa Joe and Finn Balor after they go back and forth and exchange insults. We get a match out of this. In another quick match, and I, I kind of have a theory for this, but Joe pins Finn Balor with a crucifix. He gets the three count and what almost looked like a confusing state of mind as Joe and Finn looked at each other, Joe immediately attacks Bala after the bell. Bala fights back with a coup de grace. And in celebration, the lights flicker, they go out. We at home literally get a black screen. We see nothing. But the crowd's reacting because something's going on, and I hate the timing of this. Why can't the fans at home see the exact same thing that the fans in the audience are seeing? You know, fans at home still do reaction videos and post that. But if it's not genuine where it's the same, it's real time, what you see on television, you'll see my reaction 
on YouTube, for example. They got to work on that as well. But anyway, it's The Fiend finally making his debut after what feel like forever, maybe three weeks of no Firefly Funhouse. But Bray Wyatt in his Fiend persona or his alter ego, mask and all, delivers Sister Abigail and poses and the strobe light effect going on in the ring. The lights never came back, back on in the arena while he was in there. But uh, as you can see by my background here, I try to have the best view possible of what, what took place this past week on Raw. So more than likely, we're going to pick up what took place two years ago. It's supposed to be Demon Balor versus Sister Abigail. That never took place. But, uh, it was Wyatt, unfortunately, who felt ill. Thus flying in AJ Styles from South America to uh, take up that spot and, and had that great match, Styles versus Balor. And this led to Survivor Series of uh, that year. Honestly, I was expecting maybe an appearance at Extreme Rules. Who's to say that the Philadelphia crowd would have gave a similar, if not better, response at the one that they got in Long Island. But then again, it, it would have made sense. Balor's been on a losing streak as of late, even dropping the Intercontinental title to Shinsuke Nakamura the night before. What difference would that have made if you dropped the title to Shinsuke, he attacks Balor after the match, so no post-match celebration for Shinsuke, maybe backstage, and you post that up on an exclusive video on Facebook, but he still gets attacked by Bray Wyatt. Had, had that match been on the main card of the paper of your Extreme Rules, and then follow that up. Like, okay, now now we're expecting The Fiend to show up, but how and when? And he attacks ba Balor again, maybe a little bit differently. Maybe on the staging, on the rampway, who knows? But, eh, you know, just... <laughs> Sometimes the logic and terminology and the way you're thinking that goes behind the scenes there. Sometimes everywhere else just doesn't make sense does it have to no but you can explain a little bit better than it's wrestling no one cares right that's why including myself thousands i dare say more have their own weekly podcasts their own weekly shows and interviews that they don't care they just vent and come on their own shows and bitch about what happens yeah, that's not having no care at all. Uh, to maybe some extent, an argument about not having a right to. Well, I say otherwise. The newlywed couple of Renee Michelle and Drake Maverick were trying to check in into a quote hotel on a laptop. Mm. Despite... Uh, <laughs> paying for the room and tipping the uh, assistant or clerk, whoever that was supposed to be, hundreds of dollars from Maverick. Here comes R-Truth from around the corner with a referee asking where which room Maverick would be staying in, even tipping the same man $1. I mean, hell, you received probably, not that these men don't work for tips, but Hey, you, you received several hundreds of dollars in tips. What's one more dollar going to be? And give away the information that Truth was looking for. But we'll check back in later as hometown hero Zack Ryder had his match with Mike Canellis of sorts. Before the match backstage, we see Maria once again talking down to her husband. And even suggested that she'll be the one to take on Zack Ryder as Mike was not man enough. Maria will be stopped halfway down the ramp as Mike Canellis would run past by her. Hits the ring. Bell rings. Rough Rider. Bell rings again. Ryder wins in his hometown. And Maria once again gets on the microphone talking down to her husband and just leaves him in the ring all embarrassed. In an interesting six-man tag team match, I say that because we don't see this, these kind of matches often mixing in uh, factions in this case that have really nothing to do with each other who are not even feuding with each other but here we do and here we are here we go Lucha House Party taking on the club AJ Styles 
will try to begin the match before commercial break, but was attacked by Ricochet. The match gets underway after commercial break. AJ makes Kalisto tap out to the calf crusher for the win. So Ricochet was able to get some payback there, even though it was at the Lucha House Party's expense and did not cost him the match then. But yeah, sure, I guess tap outs are more worse than uh, the disqualification. In the fatal four-way elimination women's match to determine the number one contender for the Raw Women's title to face Becky Lynch at SummerSlam, Alexa Bliss, Natalia, Naomi, and Carmella all took part. Now, I want to address that uh, the fans reacted to this match as boring, as awful. And unfortunately, I would have to agree. Despite Alexa Bliss jumping on social media saying how disrespectful the crowd was. But you got to realize something. There was a lot of like head scratching moments. The fact that the match went longer than it needed to. And this goes with a theory of mine from earlier. Well, based on one, if they're having so many short matches like they have been this week to avoid running into a commercial and not able to see the entire match uh, on one segment. So let's just have shorter matches, kind of like they used to do with Superstars and Wrestling Challenge. And even, and even some of those matches were edited to be shorter. But... Less than one minute matches, that's that's too much. You mean to tell me you can squeeze in at least a three, between a three and a five minute match. You can do so much in that amount of time before you worry about getting into commercial. And if you miss time, if you mistimed it and you wanted to do a promo or an interview right after that match, well, do it after commercial break. And maybe even shorten that promo because everything's live. That's the thing. These these time segments, when they're live, they're much more difficult to anticipate. So if one, if one of the reasons why, at least on Raw anyway, there were shorter matches is to give more attention and focus on the women's match, I, I applaud that. But unfortunately, the match was boring. At times, there was little to no chemistry. Alexa Bliss spent the majority of the time outside the ring, and we don't even know what the story really is. One, one week she's bumping, the next she's not. In this case, she spent most of the time outside the ring with only peek in to try to take opportunities and advantage of certain situations. But I'm sorry, not sorry to the women involved, but this match sucked. In the end, Alexa Bliss, ironically, was the one to tap out to a sharpshooter to Natalia, and Natalia will go on to face Becky Lynch at SummerSlam in Natalia's hometown of Canada, or home country of Canada. They both got a promo on each other, Becky is saying not, ex not to expect her friend to show up at SummerSlam. That he's more of a, she's more of a fighter than a lover. Natalia accuses Becky of not being a great lover then. Calling her a bitch. They face off. Referees come down to break up the uh, exchange, if you will. The only uh, gripe I have here is that Natalia, as she jumped off the ring apron to leave and go up the rampway, she turns to the fans and smiles. Now, this could have been one or two things. She's smiling. She's proud of what she said and did in the ring or reacting to what the fans were saying, whatever they were yelling at her that made her smile like that. You know, good promo. All right, you, you go, girl, whatever it was, and couldn't help herself but to smirk. I would have preferred Natalia get back on top of the stage, which she did do, and turn around anyway and, and have a bit of a smirk towards Becky. Like, yeah, you know, we got each other's number. And we'll see who cashes in, no pun intended, at SummerSlam. We check back in a hotel where Maverick was trying to consummate the marriage with his wife, Michelle, Renee Michelle. Only to have food service, uh, room service, I should say. Uh, a man dressed in a suit, which was the referee, who Maverick immediately recognized. He panics. By the way, he's wearing the championship belt. And the impression was that he's supposed to be naked, but no, he was wearing his tidy whities he panics, he looks around for a truth, he doesn't see him, but he was underneath the cart and rose up Maverick on the bed, right in front of his wife, gets the three count and runs off. Of course, he's very disappointed. Michelle, poor lady, us upset. I don't think they've yet to kayfabe. 
yet to consummate anything. And wasn't she th- threatening him to be divorced a couple of weeks ago? Continually, what is that? So we get to the Battle Royal. Winner faces Brock Lesnar for the Universal title at SummerSlam. So I didn't mention names, but I'll mention them here in order of the eliminations. Bobby Lashley takes out Cesaro. Roman Reigns eliminates Lashley. Somewhere in here, Randy Orton receives a Superman punch and gets thrown. Well, not thrown. He falls out of the ring. Baron Corbin eliminates Rey Mysterio. Both Roman Reigns and Braun Strowman eliminate Baron Corbin. Seth Rollins eliminates both Strowman and and Reigns and Sami Zayn was involved too I don't remember how he got eliminated but he was involved as well uh, <laughs> I, I believe it was Lashley who took him out uh, Big E was also eliminated so you noticed the first three names I mentioned all of those names at no point ever wrestled Brock Lesnar at any point with or without a championship on the line the remaining five They've all had matches with Lesnar at some point for the Universal title. With the exception of uh, Randy Orton, who got split open by Lesnar a couple of years ago at SummerSlam, ironically. So after Rollins eliminates Reigns and Strowman, thinking he was the sole survivor, from behind came Randy Orton. Rollins avoids the RKO, kick to the cut, curb stomp, and is thrown over the top rope and eliminated. So we get our rematch. Not an automatic one, but Rollins earns a rematch versus Brock Lesnar for the Universal title at SummerSlam in Canada. Over on SmackDown. I hope creatively they come up with something different for Shane McMahon because for two weeks in a row, he has sent Kevin Owens home before the show even begins. And we get to a town hall meeting of sorts with the SmackDown roster on stage. Shane is giving everyone the opportunity to step up to the microphone and speak their minds. What's wrong? What, what can be done differently to SmackDown? This and that. This whole thing was completely pointless other than to set up matches for later on in the night. Uh, I guess the only golden goose here, if you will, having Roman Reigns literally make a cameo on SmackDown. I guess he had more Hobbs and Shaw premiere commitments to get to. To tell that Shane McMahon... No one likes him and to kiss his ass. In response, Shane says that Roman Reigns will be fined for that. But from this, we get a few matches that I'll get into as uh, my review continues on here. But as everyone leaves, Cesaro emerges playing his wild card, asking for a rematch versus Alistair Black on SmackDown, and Shane McMahon obliges. As Cesaro, I guess, leaves, he didn't really have to, but... From behind came Kevin Owens and stuns Shane McMahon. Well, at least he tried to at first because Shane botched it. But then he corrected it, delivering a stunner, and Owens runs off, some, uh, presumably out of the arena. So we get our rematch from Extreme Rules as Alistair Black makes his way to the ring, coming out of the coffin, and Cesaro makes, makes his second entrance of the night. Not as good as the pay-per-view, unfortunately, but this time a little added twist the ending was the same with a black mass spinning back kick. And the impression was supposed to be that the mouthpiece that Cesaro wears would fly out of his mouth. Instead, he spits it out. So whether it was the bad camera angle or maybe uh, Cesaro didn't fully have the mouthpiece in place, not between his teeth, to be a little looser and easier to fly out once uh, Alistair made contact with his foot in his jaw. This match uh, emerged from the town hall. Charlotte Flair going one-on-one with Liv Morgan. Pink hair and blue tongue and all. But that won't be enough as Charlotte makes Mar- um, Morgan tap out to the figure eight. Shortly after the match, Morgan grabs a headset off Kobe Graves at ringside saying that Charlotte was right about not being real and that the next time we see Liv Morgan, she will be. But stay cute, Morgan. Stay cute. Ziggler was able to find Kevin Owens' cell phone number from a referee for some reason after he asked Shane McMahon for a rematch versus Kevin Owens. Shane tells Ziggler, well, if you can find Owens to come back to the arena, you can have your match. Sure. 
Sonny Deville and Mandy Rose took on Ember Moon and a choice of a tag team partner ended up being SmackDown Women's Champion Bailey. This match did not take that long as the baby faces were victorious. Bailey was asked immediately after the match who she should face next for the title. And without saying the obvious, Ember Moon will be next to try to attempt to win the SmackDown Women's title away from Bailey, more than likely taking place at SummerSlam. So right now it's a face versus face. Could, could we see a heel turn? Many would say if, if there is one, it'll probably be from Bailey because she is due. I could see that, but why not Ember? I think Ember will make a hell of a heel. New Intercontinental Champion Shisuke Nakamura is ready to face any challenges and in steps Ali, who congratulates the new champion and possibly setting him up a match here for maybe SummerSlam, but we'll find a little more next week. So all day on social media, we were expecting this career alternating announcement from Daniel Bryan for reasons. And there was an exclusive uh, uh, video or interview on social media the night before after Extreme Rules that Bryan needed to do something. He needed to make changes. Instead, the New Day decided to take up this particular spot of this segment and mock whatever Brian was going to say because he never got a word in. He and Rowan will make it as far as halfway down the ramp. And by the third time, Brian was so upset from the mockery and the, and the disrespect from the New Day who was celebrating everyone being new and... Uh, a faction of champions, tag team and WWE. Brian literally drops the mic and walks out with Roman, never got a word in. So we never got to find out what this was. Maybe uh, a ratings bait? Immediately after, we see Samoa Joe wanting a rematch with Kofi Kingston. Instead, Elias steps in and says it should be him against Kingston for the title. And now comes Randy Orton. I guess officially making him a heel on this run. So I like how they did a little nod. Uh, I think it was Xavier Woods. So do we have a six-man tag team match or what, player? Because everything needs to be a tag team match. Sure enough, we get a six-man tag team match here. At the end, we see Randy Orton delivering an RKO to Kofi Kingston. Definitely a rival that didn't really end, at least I, at least I feel, before. Only this time, the, the roles are reversed a little bit. And adding in the WWE Championship, should be interesting to see moving down with Randy Orton and uh, Kofi Kingston for the title, possibly again at SummerSlam. The only time we will see these two, Carmella and R-Truth. Carmella was looking for him backstage, finds him in a washing machine of all things, suggests to him that we should find a better place to hide, and we never see them again. Thanks for coming. So finally, after what seemed forever, the Iconics defend the women's tag team titles against the Kabuki Warriors in this case with Paige in their corner. The Kabuki Warriors showed dominance early on in the match, but the Iconics didn't feel like uh, keeping up with them, so they jump out of the ring, they grab their titles, and intentionally get counted out. This, of course, brings the Iconics back into the ring forcefully by the Kabuki Warriors as Kyrie Sane delivers in the insane elbow and stand, uh, well, victorious but not as champions. So maybe we'll see a rematch, possibly involving more women at SummerSlam, because why are these titles invented again? Another match that was set up based on the uh, town hall, Andrade, once again, one-on-one with Apollo Crews, and gets attacked before the bell rang, but that didn't stop Apollo from making his comeback. After double knees from Andrade in a corner, Apollo immediately jumped back up, rolled him up, and got the win. So he no-sells the double knees in the corner, Apollo did, and just gets the win seemingly out of nowhere. And in our main event, we finally get Kevin Owens, who apparently received and accepted Dolph Ziggler's uh, cell phone call and agreed to come back to the arena for this match. And this took much longer than 13 seconds compared to the Extreme Rules, but this turned into a lumberjack match out of nowhere because Shane McMahon would come down to the ring with a few other heels and they surrounded 
the area. Owens would deliver a stunner to Dolph Ziggler, goes for the pin, but Shane would pull Kevin Owens out of the ring. Owens would then deliver yet another stunner to Shane, only this time outside of the ring, and he would run off, avoiding an attack trap by the heels, and the match was thrown out. Just as SmackDown was going off the air, Shane would vow revenge against Kevin Owens. So that was your Raw and SmackDown review followed, or right after the Extreme Rules Evolve 10th Anniversary, the AEW Fight for the Fallen. Whew. I'm just exhausted at this point. And I still got some more news bit to get. Thankfully, it was a bit of a slow week, to say the least. Not much was going on, but just enough to share. This Monday Night on Raw is the Raw Reunion Show, a.k.a. Desperate for Ratings Raw Reunion Show. As this was uh, promoted and advertised during Extreme Rules and Monday Night Raw, obviously, and of course SmackDown. Many names were announced. Most recently, Melina. Be great to see her again, hopefully in a satisfying appearance, not just backstage playing cards. So Ric Flair, Booker T, Diesel, Devon minus Bully Ray, Mark Henry, X-Pac, Kelly Kelly, Road Dog, Sid Vicious, Rikishi, Boogeyman, Ron Simmons, Hulk Hogan, Stone Cold Steve Austin, Ric Flair, Shawn Michaels, Sting, Triple H, and uh, Santino Morala for some reason, among others, are expected to appear including the stooges of Pat Patterson and Gerald Briscoe at some point during the Raw reunion show. It's not old school Raw anymore. It's reunion show. I'm waiting to see them have the Raw alumni show. None of these men are expected to have any matches, although some of them can still go. But we'll see. If they're just cameos or just pop their heads out through the current, similar to Raw 25, I won't expect too much out of this coming up, but it's under a different direction, a la Paul Heyman. We'll see if any of them will show up on SmackDown the next time. Matter of fact, Shawn Michaels is scheduled to be a guest commentator during SmackDown. So hopefully he won't be the only one to, you know, balance out the shows a little bit with cameos from Legends and Hall of Famers, because why not? We got them for both Raw, why not for SmackDown? Lex Luger. Recently had an interview with uh, Hannibal TV where he discussed his arrest back in 2003. Uh, he was charged with a, a misdemeanor count of battery. And this is when neighbors were calling, complaining to police about seeing both Lex Luger and Miss Elizabeth at the time. They were a couple, they were living together. But more specifically, that Miss Elizabeth was sporting two blacks. So this raised concern, the police were called. And Luger, just like he did back then, uh, retold the story here that Elizabeth got those black guys from walking the dogs. There was one German Shepherd and a Husky, and how, how he put it, Luger, the two dogs can get frisky with each other, and the leashes will wrap around Miss Elizabeth's legs, causing her to trip and fall, causing damage to her face. So it was never Luger placing any hands on her, despite having arguments later on that night because she was so upset that it happened. An argument still ensued. And when that's, this is when police were called in. And Luger defended himself saying, she had been crying as we had been arguing that night, but it was never a physical thing. Take that for what it's worth. Unfortunately, Miss Elizabeth is no, no longer with us to uh, share her side of the story. But uh, Luger did serve his time. Not not so much for the uh, the misdemeanor charge, but uh, find a few uh, you know un unprescribed drugs in the house, growth hormones, steroids, among other things. Uh, just a bad time to be a Lex Luger fan for sure. So a little bit about Finn Balor and what's going on with so many of these. Uh, losing matches back to back but according to the pro wrestling sheet balor will be taking a little bit of time off from the wwe post summer slam 
he has asked for at least two months off to recharge himself. Other than that, there was no other reason why Bala is giving or asking for specifically two, two months off uh, to recharge. I mean, yeah, they all reached that point. They want to take a few months, maybe the rest of the year off, recharge and heal the body, so to speak. Uh, besides that, the besides the shoulder injury that uh, Bala received a few years ago when he won the first time Universal title uh, at SummerSlam, that was the only time he had surgery, I believe. And he's been going full force, at least when they remember that he had him on the roster. But it'll be interesting to see exactly at SummerSlam, more likely or after SummerSlam, if the plan is to go forward with The Fiend versus The Demon. I think that'll be the first time The Demon would have a loss on the main roster. Congratulations are in order for MLW. Not only have they acquired the talents of Georgia Smith a couple of weeks ago, who, by the way, I did have an interview with on the first ever Talking with JM episode. I encourage everyone to take a listen. There's a lot of uh, insightful information. Uh, for those who don't know, she is the daughter of legendary Davy Boy Smith, the British Bulldog himself. We discuss everything from upbringings, how life was with her father, with a brother who, who also was part of MLW, Harry Hart, or excuse me, Harry Hart Smith, but he, go, he now goes by Debbie Boy Smith Jr., who was also one of the guys who tackled that little piece of, during the Hall of Fame ceremony for Jim Neidhart. Um, yeah, I encourage everyone to go check out the YouTube channel of Good Old JM. Scroll down to the first ever episode of Talking with JM with Georgia Smith. But not only that, the MLW acquired, they also have now airtime on television in Africa with Star Times. Major League uh, Wrestling, or MLW for short, their series uh, airs on Fusion for the first time ever in Africa. They announced this week it has entered into an agreement to broadcast its flagship weekly hour-long program of MLW Fusion non-exclusively in Africa on Star Times. So kudos, Mazatov, congratulations all around to MLW as they are expanding. Many forget that they're, they're a team player, not necessarily competition per se, but they've always pulled great shows, great events, a lot of back and forth with talent between their AEW, New Japan, Triple uh, A, among other places. So it's a great time to be a pro wrestling fan again. If the post attitude error and aggressive, uh, aggressive aggression, ruthless aggression, geez, I'm so tongue tied today. If that time error is what kept you away from pro wrestling as a whole, I would say, using the word again, encourage those to come back and be a wrestling fan again. I'm sure many have heard by now the unfortunate incarceration of Jeff Hardy. Arrested last weekend in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. At the time, other than being intoxicated publicly, but what other reason was there? Was he stumbling, trying to get from point A to point B, which would have been his home, I would assume? Was he about to get into an altercation? Was he thrown out of a bar? We don't know, at least up until now. Hardy had told officers that he had been drinking vodka and was taken into custody near 1600 North Ocean Boulevard, which was near the Hilton Grand Vacation Hotel. Myrtle Beach Police Department has the arrest listed as being taken place around 11.30 a.m., and under South Carolina law, public disorderly conduct is a misdemeanor. Hardy paid the bond of $153 as a first-time offender. Hardy won't be required to appear in court unless he wants to contest the charges. WWE did put out a statement last week that basically saying Hardy's responsible for his own actions. You can read into that as much as you want. So seemingly, 
because he paid his fine and be, because being a first-time offender, uh, slap in the wrist, don't do it again. And life, life goes on. I mean, what, what more can be said? But uh, he's still out with injury, rehabbing his, uh, his knee surgery. Who knows? I mean, honestly, we, we, we've been there before with Jeff Hardy. The start, the start and stop momentum, whether it was with WWE, whether it was uh, Impact Wrestling or anywhere else. It's unfortunate. You know, I'm one of those uh, diehard Jeff Hardy fans from back in the day of 99. And yes, even Matt and, Matt and Jeff Hardy debuted pre-date 1999. I, I get that. But uh, I just hope he gets his stuff together, man. It's just enough. You're a father of two now. Unclear exactly what drove him to do what he did with the vodka. But maybe he should have a traveling buddy. Who knows? Mickey James went under successful ACL surgery this week. She will not be expecting to return to the ring until maybe sometime early 2020. Mickey James announced last month uh, via Instagram that she had her ACL torn with a match against Carla at a house show. And after the surgery, husband Nick uh, Aldis tweeted that Mickey is doing great. It was a successful surgery and now would attend physical therapy. And another story that involves incarceration and, well, it's a little bit worse than what happened with Jeff. But the Minnesota Star Tribune reported that former WWF and AWA star John Nord, better known as the Berserker, ironically used to known as the Viking before he turned into the Berserker, was sentenced to five years probation to be placed in restrictive housing and banned from any driving whatsoever following a series of arrests from driving under the influence, seven in total, according to the Minnesota Star investigation in recent years. Court records indicated that there were 16 incidences where authorities charged the berserker, but let's just really call him from what we know him as, while or with either a felony or a misdemeanor over the last decade. Most recently back of March of this year, where the berserker was arrested for finally for driving while intoxicated slash operating a car under the influence of, of a controlled substance, as well as driving after his license was canceled or revoked for lack of a better term, and will be a later again arrested driving with said revoked license. I mean, when you want to raise a bar, geez, no pun intended. There were six other incidences where the berserker was driving with his license revoked. Again, all this according to the Star Tribune. The, pros the prosecution pushed for a four-year prison sentence, arguing that the berserker represents a significant public safety threat as he has continued to drive after his arrest, after being ordered not to do so. And of course, after being his license revoked and canceled. The attorney for the berserker, or John Nord, their defense argued that the berserker who has been diagnosed with ALS has been using painkillers to deal with the physical and mental damage his work as a pro wrestler has left him with, is currently in treatment for the issues for the rest of his life and will need to live in an, uh, uh, an assisted living facility. The judge of the case, Judge Jay Kwam, noted that the berserker sentencing was a hard decision to make, saying, life has handed you a lot of special things. On the other hand, it's taken away a lot of things or what makes you, you. So in short, the berserker will be serving a home arrest for the next four years. Excuse me, uh, five years. But technically, it's probation. 
not allowed to be anywhere near another vehicle, much less drive another one, despite the judge showing a little bit, a tad of leniency. You got to be home. You got to stay home. I'm sure somewhere in there a discussion was made about no contact with any kind of uh, alcohol or anything that will put you under the influence again. But stay at home. It's unfortunate because uh, he was set last year, or maybe the year before the berserker was, to make a few uh, public appearances. One being in New York, and after the first hour realizing that he didn't show up, I don't think he's coming. I don't think this had anything to do with it, obviously, or nor that one of the incidences that I mentioned was what prevented him from appearing in New York. But uh, you make choices that could be very difficult ones, thus making life difficult itself. So you live and learn. Jim Ross stated on social media that Vince McMahon personally invited him to join the Raw Reunion show. But decline, and this even after coming from AEW President Tony Khan, that he would have his blessing had Jim Ross accepted the invitation and that the decision was up to Jim Ross. Interesting. I mean, I don't see Billy Gunn's name on the list, but maybe, you know, you never know. But surprisingly, Ross turned it down for reasons we may get later on. But for now, he's he's a busy man. He's doing his Grilling with JR, with Comrade Thompson. He's got his own podcast running. He's with AEW, traveling around the world. Uh, I don't believe he has a deal with uh, New Japan anymore as one of their commentators. So, man is busy. Not to mention he travels a lot. And I don't think one of those stops were meant to be at the Raw Reunion Show. So, hats off to Jim Ross for making such a decision. Because as much as we all would have loved to see Jim Ross perhaps for the last time in WWE under these circumstances, I think it would be better off if Jim Ross were to make any kind of return. It would be on under his terms to say goodbye the proper way. Will Ospreay, the current IWGP Junior Heavyweight Champion, has announced that he will be returning to the ring, which he did, this week for New Japan Pro Wrestling's G1 Climax after being held out of his last scheduled appearance. The belief was that Osprey suffered a stinger and was held off for the last events as a precaution. Uh, it's not the first time Osprey has been uh, taken off TV for injury, but I will be a little bit more careful. This is about the, probably the second time in a month. I'll be careful moving forward a little bit. I announced earlier that Bischoff has finally, Eric Bischoff, has finally moved into Connecticut to his new home to be closer to WWE headquarters this week, a matter of fact, and officially has started his role as executive director of SmackDown this week. So a lot of us were under the impression that it was about two weeks ago when Heyman started. No, Bischoff was still moving out of his old home to his new one. A lot of people thought that'll be at Extreme Rules. Nope, not yet. Instead, officially, Bischoff and him working side by side or together at the same time on separate shows post Extreme Rules. So I would imagine that they wanted to get through the Extreme Rules storylines, the, the angles, all of that out of the way to have a fresh start with Heyman and uh, Bischoff at the helm. Uh, it was teased this week and they, they, it came through. During the WWE panel of San Diego Comic Con, that Drake Maverick was looking for our truth. Now we saw late in the afternoon yesterday in room six A at the Mattel booth, Drake Maverick was passing out wanted signs for our uh, truth. Uh, as I'm here at the studios, I have not seen or heard of any potential uh, impromptu matches at said Comic Con. But Maverick, obviously, is looking for and hunting for Truth to get back his 24-7 championship. And this gives a little interaction with the fans at Comic-Con, a little something else to do. Plus, Zack Ryder and Kurt Hawkins there uh, at the motel booth uh, displaying and uh, presenting new upcoming action figures. And I saw 
a lot of them. They look great. Can't wait for the first ever Fiend action figure, which I'm sure will sell out like hotcakes. A bit of a head-scratcher that they mashed up the WWE with the Masters of the Universe, thus calling it Masters of the WWE Universe or some crap like that. Basically, they're WWE uh, wrestling figures as throwbacks to the original lineup of Mattel He-Man toys. Uh, same type of, of body uh, sculptor. Uh, <laughs> no bending of the knees or the, or the elbows. Nothing like that. It's a complete throwback other than maybe their, their help, the hip bones and shoulder joints and their heads are the only ones that can rotate. Otherwise, <laughs> you're stuck with what you got. And uh, I appreciate what they were trying to do, but as a collector myself, uh, I, just, I just don't see it. You know, maybe later on you know, they'll, they'll win me over. But for now, from what I saw, I, I know they're all prototypes, but uh, not now. Not really. Braun Strowman has announced that he has signed a new contract with the WWE as he took to Instagram, basically shouting his comments, saying, well, I'm sure more than a few of you will make this announcement. Here's to four more years of being the hardest working and best big man in the whole damn industry and working for the greatest promotion in the world, the WWE. I hope uh, Strowman got a bonus after making that announcement. And a bit of a out-of-nowhere story, but after reading the statement, uh, it's understanding as to why it was approached the way it was. But last week, Legend Harley Race was hospitalized and a representative of the family released an official statement as to what happened. This past weekend, he was scheduled to attend the Knoxville Fanboy Expo. While traveling to Knoxville, he exhibited some signs that needed to be addressed by medical personnel. He has been in the hospital since Thursday evening of last week. And that's where he currently is. Due to privacy concerns, no specific information will be given out about his current health status or anything of the sort. All that can and will be said is that Harley Race was, is, and will always be a fighter. He doesn't know anything else, and he hasn't thrown in the towel, and he has promised that as long as, it, as, long as it, it's up to him, that won't be an option. His health is obviously top priority. And with that being said, all of his upcoming appearances will be immediately canceled. All promoters have been notified about the situation. And we here are currently trying to come up with a solution. Uh, the best possible way. Unfortunately, since this situation has taken place while traveling to a signing, he is currently in a hospital that is pretty far away from home that could have his family there with him. So beyond this statement, we, we do not know still, even after a week after the fact of what happened with Harley Race, uh, even though the story broke a week after the fact. But whatever it is, hopefully Mr. Race can feel better and pull through with whatever is going on and that uh, we can see him continue his uh, appearances publicly, giving back to the fans as he loves to do. I met the man several times, can't be any more of a gentleman than I could uh, describe, but uh, my best well wishes to get well soon go out to Harley Race and his family and friends. With that said, I want to thank everyone for listening in. Though it's been a hard uh, day yesterday for me personally, but we all come to that point in time, uh, regardless of how much has passed, to decide when would be the right time to move on with life. When I was younger, I questioned myself all the time. I even had doubts about it. But at the end, you sometimes ask yourself or someone who, who sees you struggling with such decisions to make can step in and say, what would have the one that you lost wanted you to do. 
you can only suffer and mourn for so long before your life can continue. And it may sound a little shitty for me to say to some people. And it's really harsh to say, you know, just get up and move on because there's nothing you can do about it. You can't make any changes for what's been done. Unfortunately, that's a fact. And as far as my loss of my godfather, he he's always known. He was the one to introduce me to a copy VHS tape of WrestleMania 3. <laughs> the original broadcast, which was which is much different than what's on the network now. I don't know whatever happened to that tape. And um, every chance he he gotten to get a copy of whichever pay-per-view would come out, because back then it was about maybe three at a time a year, and um, we'll send it over to my father, and we'll watch it at home that weekend. And, you know, he spoiled me when he could. My godmother, too. But, you know, even that changes. Even sometimes you got to come to that realization that, hey, you know, he's a grown boy. He's a big man now. You can't spoil him the rest of his life. And you come to that realization, and, yeah, I am growing up. Didn't change how I felt about him and his family. They're all great people. So that, among other reasons that I'll probably be here all day sharing with you. Yeah, less than 24 hours that I got the news, and here I am doing what I love doing on a weekly basis. I know where he is now. He's with uh, my grandfather. Toasting each other's uh, reunion, if you will. I can't speak for the others who are mourning at this time. But I like to believe that they are looking down on me with the utmost proudest that they could be. And I know that one day I'll get a chance to say thank you for everything. Again, thank you for joining me here. Stay tuned as I will have another episode of Talking with JM coming up real soon. My special guest will be Lady Oyanka, as she will be providing information of the upcoming Glow Cruise scheduled for September of 2019. Also, you can get to know, get to know her a little bit better. She was part of the uh, four-way conversation that I had a, a few weeks ago with Hollywood and Lightning, two of the original Glow Girls. So hopefully it will be under of a more organized uh, setting and I could ask her more questions as far as getting to know who Lady Oyanka is. So everyone, behave, be good, 